bring that up. Who? Yeah. Skype or Slack? I was going to use Slack to tell Oh, yeah. But I mean, so, Skype is fine. I'll tell you, I, 
I, I tell you, I, I, uh, yeah, since I've taught the class before, I, you know, I've got some familiarity with the material, right? And so I go through a process like during two weeks in advance. I, like the first week, I kind of gather everything. I prepped the class months earlier, but then I sort of put it aside and I gather and start organizing. And then, like Tuesday, I go through notes. Well, guys, I need stuff off the tables. I'm telling you, it, it's very, very disruptive. Very, phones and all that stuff are very disruptive. You gotta go, go outside, do whatever you need to do. But um, it's disruptive to talk to the tops of heads, okay? I gathered the stuff Tuesday, went through it again. I did it Thursday and I did it again yesterday morning and there's a lot, you know, so let's just work through it, ask questions, uh, and uh, hopefully we, we learn things, some, some things, okay? So, um, what's the subject matter today? What's the general? Hey, what, to clear your desk and have a pop quiz? No. <laughs> We're not going to, that wouldn't be fair. It probably would not be fair. No fair. Uh, it would not be fair. So, and we appreciate your understanding. Yeah, no, I listen, the, the purpose of education is to learn. It's not to it's not to trick. It's not to assess. You know, I, I had a No, no, look, we have to assess. That's unfortunately grades come, right? There's an evaluation that comes with the learning process. And if we don't evaluate, then we don't really know if people learn. No, no, no. What I'm saying, the focus should be teaching and learning, not assessing. Right. Right. I mean, but but I know, but if we don't have the hammer the effort, you know, is a little bit, so whatever. So anyway, the general, <laughs> yeah, whatever, yeah, I'll read, I'll read. I would bet, I would bet that not everybody has read all these chapters, but I don't want to know who didn't, because those who didn't will have missed an opportunity to learn, okay? Uh, chapters this week were 17, 18, 19, and then 22 and 23, and what I try to do is gather, um, similar thinking so the the part today is on the debt side of the capital stack right so if we keep thinking about right our balance sheet with assets and then liabilities or debt and equity we're going to focus on the debt side and and that obviously has something associated with it which is interest rate so the whole thinking today goes to you know theory behind interest rate, construction of, of, of interest rate curves, the, the, the structure, the term structure of interest rates. And we're also going to talk about debt instruments and some of the features that are associated with debt instruments. We may or may not be involved. I mean, a lot of times capital market books take a look at, that's not good. <laughs> take a look at, uh, whatever, I'll, the, they, they take a look at, at instruments almost really from an investor side. But that's okay. We can always look at the mirror side, right? So, no, yeah, but don't, don't, don't worry right now. I'm sure, I'm glad yeah. you're taking the time. Okay. So, uh, so we, we can take a look at, you know, if, 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 if it, something like, you know, callability impacts, you know, an issuer one way or a holder of the debt one way. You know, we can always look at what the converse effect are. You know, things that may be advantages to one party maybe disadvantages to another party. So, you know, the, the book kind of goes, you know, one way or another. I may focus my thinking one way, but that doesn't mean that we can't look at the converse of that, right, and say, okay, well, if I'm the holder and callability affects me, well, how does it affect the issuer? Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, well, excellent, thank you. Give the man a star. <laughs> And then uh, we've got some individual presentations today, and after the presentations, we uh, uh, we're going we're to sign the, uh, the midterm questions and, and take them home and turn them in. Okay. Um, we are going to go through uh, calls. So what that means is those of you who are on next time, those of you who are on for the next session, should dial in to the go-to meeting on Tuesday. Now, I sorted out my issues. I know those of you dialed in, I prompt, I think there were Windows 10 issues. I got on with some of you with my iPad afterwards, and it worked fine. So I'll just do it with the iPad from now on. And 
um, shouldn't have any issues there. I, I, I would encourage you. I yes, do please. have a question about that meeting. Uh, yes, I believe some of us here are going to that meeting in Miami, uh, NALD meeting. Uh -huh. So, what well, could you can communicate? Here's here's my my interest. My interest is that you, after, after reading the article, that you put together your thinking on where you want to go with it. And I do want to say, I don't want to steal the thunder from any other presentation here. I think we had a lot of missed opportunities this week with the presentations. And, and, and those were opportunities to learn and to challenge ourselves and go beyond reading an article and just summarizing the article. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in critical thinking that helps us formulate decisions as to what we will do or not do, right? So a lot of times... I was, I was actually so talking it, about the timing of the meeting. I wonder how many people were able to make it. About half of them, but send me an email. And, and my problem this week, I'm traveling, and I'm traveling overseas this week, so I just don't have a lot of flexibility. I'm out for five days, and so email will work. I'll, I'll check emails while I'm away. So if you can't make the call, that's okay. I, I, mean, I, I, I understand. I, those who couldn't make it still have access, you know, and I may work for other, some people, you take your time that way. But again, I'm going to go back to read the emails and read the comments, and don't miss the opportunities. So if you can dial in, great. If you can't, just use the uh, um, Wall Street Journal assessments. I think I had one student who didn't. I don't know what happened. Some of you didn't um, register till I sent a reminder. I was kind of concerned when I went to see how many people had done the, the first assessment. And like more than half the class hadn't even signed up. And eventually everybody signed up and only I think one student didn't do it, which these things are, look, they're easy. It, it, I, I, I need, I'm trying to give you like opportunity to earn points. Okay, now, they're going to get tougher, okay? There's another one that's been assigned. So you still have access to the articles. It tells you what article, but the time's been compressed a little bit. Don't be, so, don't be surprised if the next time, maybe you don't have a link to the articles or the time is compressed. You know, it's... Ten minutes was a little bit of a challenge. Well, but the point, right, but the, the, the point is, what I'm trying, what I'm, but what I'm trying to develop is the habit the habit of reading the financial press regularly to know what's going on. We'll talk about some current events and all that. There's a lot going on. Where, where's the 10-year treasury today? What, where's the 10-year treasury? I mean, you guys are in a real graduate real estate program that should blurt out. Where's 10-year treasury today? Okay, and, and, and how has that changed since we last met, or how has that changed since Wednesday? It's increased. Okay, well, where was it? Like 1.97, it was right at 2, two weeks ago. So it's up 32, 33 basis points in two weeks. That's a more than 10% increase. Is that normal in treasuries? Do we get those kind of changes? What's happening? The jobs report was released. Well, but that, that all happened in advance of the job report. The job report spiked it, but it was already up to 225 when the job report came out yesterday morning. Speculation the Fed's going to raise rates. Well, uh, speculation or is there knowledge? You know, I mean, I go back to, I mean, are we in an efficient market? Do the markets know more than the Fed does, you know? Because that all moved. That all started moving well in advance, okay? And so, you know, stuff, does it filter? I mean, I go back to, and this is a, a perfect class for why are people looking at options? data and making trades based on that. Why are people looking at insider trades? And I don't mean insider trading in an illegal sense, but folks de defined as insiders who are either buying or selling on their account. And what do they know? And why are people following those trades, right? And ultimately, why do a lot of analysts talk about, well, the market is predicting, right? There are things, we'll talk about it later on, there, there, there is a, a high to low yield ratio, right? And as it compresses, people are assuming that the economy is you know, going to get better. We're going to talk about the term structure and, and, and how the interest rate curve should look. And based on those tea leaves, people are, are assuming that there's certain things going to happen or are happening in the market. And whether you buy it or not, the market does have a fair amount of information that's priced into it already. And it 
sort of knows more than the news that we're reading in the morning. So anyway, but we need to know that. So, and how do we know that? If you're reading the Wall Street Journal every day, if you have the Wall Street Journal online open as one of the windows and you check it every, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, and just to see where the major indices are going and see where interest rates are going, we get a sense because, look, at the end of the day, you say, well, why do I care? I'm studying real estate. Well, do we buy or do we sell? Do we fix rates or do we stay variable? What sort of term do we look for based on the expectations that we have, right? And, you know, extending that a little bit further, if the jobs report has an impact, if employment has an impact on retail or if employment has a, an impact on office, for example. If employment has an impact on hotels, do, do we buy, do we sell, do we hunker down, do we cut costs? What do we need to do in order to manage our business efficiently based on what's going on in the economy? So, that's, so the purpose of the assessments isn't to assess you and hammer you, but it's to mold and shape you into getting used to reading financial press on a constant um, basis, okay? Um, I, I, this was a question that came out the last time. It's not really covered in the book, or if it is, it's not in a great sense, and I went through some clarification. There were, there's three entities that people talk about all the time. There's the World Bank, there's the IMF, and there's the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements. So, I mean, that came up, class, that came up the last time I wrote down some notes and I thought maybe I should just go over it now. It's you know sort of a general thing. Um, IMF, does that ring a bell to anybody? International Monetary, Monetary Fund. Fund. Okay, the International Monetary Fund. What is the International Monetary Fund? Okay, so that's, you know, basically it's kind of like a United Nations but for money. <coughs> I think it's got like 190 members or something like that. The head of that is Christine Lagarde, the French lady who had been a prime minister or something for a while, very well spoken. Uh, it's more than anything else. It's a policy-making board. It, it it tries to help formulate, you know, global monetary cooperation, dialogue between central banks. It tries to shape policy, right? It, you know, she travels. She, when I say she, she's the public face of it. It's an organization that tries to maintain monetary stability. At the end of the day, they're going to tell you the same thing. What? Like, job creation and monetary stability on a worldwide basis. But it is, it, it is a policy-making board more than anything else. An affiliated entity is the World Bank. Now, what does the World Bank do? Who is the World Bank? What does the World Bank do? What countries in particular? Well, right, so probably more needy. So, you know, the questions that, that, that come to mind right away, if you are, um, you know, the state of Nevada and you want to dam the Colorado River, right? You're going to build the Hoover Dam. Where do you go get your money? There's probably enough resources here to finance it within this country. You know, you got all the private equity and, you know, consortia of banks and all that. But if you're Bolivia, right, and you need to, you know, or you're Bangladesh and you need to dam something so that you don't have all the, you know, runoff and, and, and devastation, who do you go to? You got no credit. So, it's it's a it's sort of infrastructure large project lender primarily primarily for underdeveloped countries. Um, it, it gets its equity from its members, right? So generally, the 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 better off the more developed nations provide the equity, and they provide uh, uh, financing. You know, low cost, interest free. Again, trying to help distribute wealth throughout the world. What is the BIS? The Bank of International Settlements. Does that ring a bell at all or no? No. Okay, have you guys heard of Basel, Basel I, Basel II, Basel III? Those are all, so the Bank of International Settlements is based in Basel, Switzerland, okay? And, and so they are, to some extent, a policy-making board, but to some extent, they are the central bank of the central banks. They are the organization that facilitate transfers of money between member banks. So like if you get a SWIFT number or whatever, if you're trying to send money from here to somebody in Germany or you know, and, you know, wherever the Philippines, 
Um, the Bank of International Settlements is the one that is facilitating that. It is also a formulating or a, or a, a policy making board which sets or tries to set central bank guidelines throughout the world. Um, we are now on the third round of these Basel agreements or, 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 uh, detailing or stipulating what bank capital requirements should be. That's a big deal. Why is it important for banks to have capital? So why, why would a bank want to have a lot of capital? Well, one thing would be so that they can lend, but probably more than anything is so that they can withstand losses, right? So if you just stop to think of my sort of, you know, so if you got a bunch of assets on a bank's books, loans or assets, right? If you have a very thin capital base and some of these loans go bad, what happens? Something we'll talk about later, you know, at least insolvency, maybe bankruptcy, <coughs> but at least insolvency, right? And what, what, what do countries need? Countries need banks to be Solved. Stable, stable, solvent, have liquidity, yes, Noah? Is the new Basel one the one targeting the eight largest banks? No, that's, we'll talk about that in a second. So Basel III does talk to capital requirements. Um, you're talking about, let's get to the article and, 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 and we'll mention this. Now, the, the, the sort of, going to Frederick's point, right, the more capital that banks are required to have, right, to some extent it provides more stability, right? But um, if you look at the return on equity formula, right, net income over what? Over what, what? Net worth, right? Equity, right? The bigger the denominator, right? Given all other factors, the smaller, the the smaller your ROE. So as a shareholder, you want maximum leverage, right? You want the lowest. So there's there's a push there, right? And then, you know, the other sort of side of this is there's a certain amount of reserves that, that banks are required to retain or maintain, which are funds they can't loan. And so, you know, there's this whole, you know, push going on. But ultimately, what they're trying to talk to is, is central bank stability, bank stability, so that there is um, 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 a solid financial institution, you know, base out there. So we don't have the problems, the systemic problems that occurred in 2007 and 2008 that it you know, almost wiped out a lot of economies, okay? As I said, there's a lot going on. I just, I just cut a couple of things up to go over with you. This is, a, this is a sort of interesting point. It's frightening in a way. I got this out of the journal yesterday. It says it. First time home buyers, as a percentage of overall buyers, has dropped to its lowest level since 1987. So it's just basically saying first time home buyers fell to 32% of all purchasers, okay? And it hasn't been that low. It says nationally, the median, nationally, the median home price is $221,000. So you go back to, I, I don't know what the number is, but you know, US GDP per person is somewhere like, 50 some odd thousand bucks, do the math. Most people, you don't find it difficult and it becomes more so. Victor's gonna make a presentation later on about multifamily. And so we just go through the whole issue of, do we buy, do we rent, what's more affordable, what isn't affordable, at what point do we make the you know, buy, sell, or buy, rent decision. Now what is public policy talk to in regards to that? There's been a lot of tax policy and a lot of tax structuring but that's tried to support home ownership. What is the historical home ownership ratio in this country? You know, any idea? What percentage of people own their own homes? The 60s, 67. Okay, so, you know, I'm doing this all off the top of my head because I, I read the journal but I'm getting old and I forget stuff, okay? But somewhere between 63 and 67, we've oscillated over the last 20 years. Now, that may not seem like a a, a, a big shift, right? But if you stop to think about, you know, what, 110, 120 million households or whatever, 4% of that, it, you know, could be, you know, 5 billion homes, right? So, so th th there could be big dislocations, um, you know, with, with those percentage changes. Now, curiously, there were things like the Community Lending Act, um, 
and, and a lot of regulatory pressure from, you know, sort of late 1980s, you know, through the Clinton years, that sort of pushed banks to lower lending standards. There was a lot of shadow banking, uh, uh, you know, participation in the credit markets. And we wound up with, I think by 2008, a level of 67%. So policy did, in fact, formulate that. Now, in addition to that policy, what's the biggest tax deduction most people take? Mortgage, Mortgage interest. So what's the next one most people take? The property taxes on their, on their home, right? And so there's definitely tax policy that supports home ownership, right? So why? Because I, I think the, 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 the perception is if you own a home, you've created wealth. And in fact, in most people's lifetime, the single biggest wealth creation vehicle that they'll have is what? Home. Their home, right? So so that's important, right? So anyway, it's, it's somewhere sort of called back since 2008. I don't know where it is today. It's somewhere in that towards bottom. Yes? Is that 67% include people that own multiple homes? Or I, I, is it I, 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 don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I'd have to take a look. I don't know the answer. I mean, I think, I think the issue is at least, I, my, my guess would be primary residence as opposed to counting people double force, you know, multiple homes. But at least a primary residence. Okay, now, how does that contrast to other countries? Is that high? Is that low? High. High? How much higher do we know? I don't know the answer to that. I know intuitively it is higher. I know in countries like Germany that tend this to, this to rent. But I don't know what the percentages are. Those, that's the kind of thing that when we address articles here, when, when we address topics, those are things we should look for and try to understand and learn, right? And say, hey, it's the 63 to 67 doesn't sound like a big jump, but if you quantify it by the number of households, that's huge. So all of a sudden, five million homes, you know, are up for sale because people don't want to live there, can't afford to live there. Is it going to impact pricing? Absolutely. Is that what happened in 2008? Absolutely. So anyway, um, I just cut this out. I, I, this is another magazine I recommend, Florida Trend. If you want to know what's happening in the state, it's a great. It's 12 bucks a year. It comes out. It's nice. Print on nice, you know, nice paper. It's awesome. It really is. I highly recommend it. Uh, here's an interesting one. We're talking about capital markets. So I try to focus stuff here in this class. Uh, these are from The Economist um, from the last two different weeks. Shares aren't alike. And curious for me, what percentage of shareholdings in companies are owned by individuals versus what are owned by institutions? Any idea? And how has that evolved over time? So, you know, I would tell you just from the little I dab dabble in the stock market, I would say institutions own the lion's share of, of, of companies. And it seems like it's been like that for a long time. And in fact, and in fact, intuition is right, um, um, almost 80% of shareholdings in companies today are owned by institutions. Almost 80%. But that contrast to 1950, where less than 20% of shareholdings were owned by institutions. And so, you know, it seemed like part of the American dream in the 50s was to not only own your house, but to be a shareholder in companies. And now that that is, if we own shares in companies, we do so indirectly through institutional holdings, through pension plans that we may have, um, you know, investments in funds that we may have. And so every day, more and more, shareholdings and, and stock market activity is of institutional nature. What are the implications of that as individual investors? You get pushed out in the flash crash. Well, you either get pushed out or the fact is you don't have access to, you know, the information or the technology or the quickness in order to make those decisions. So you, you're going along for the ride. Yeah, no control. Actually, uh, you would hold your assets into a separate entity for protection. So well, you 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 could you could do that as well. I mean, one of the look not only protection. We, one of the things we keep talking about in this class, and it'll be the subject of one of the articles, is 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 to the extent that instead of buying an equity directly, one buys a fund. You're getting diversification, and we'll talk when we get to modern portfolio theory, and we talk about. Uh, 
um, you know, not putting all of our eggs in one basket. Yeah, there is a, and, and I deal with that in more in the accounting class, how we structure real estate in such a way as to shield it, right, through corporate holdings. But definitely from a whole, from a fund perspective and from a shareholdings perspective, to the extent that we can diversify and that we can rely on professional management that has access to information that we don't have, right, we might have an advantage or we might be protected or we might be able to participate. No, was that you who had his hand up? Oh, I was just going to say, I'm kind of worried about the fund currently because of their stake in uh, all the tech companies and through private equity and there's no good valuation because it's not public information. So they're sitting down at the meetings or listening in and, for example, you know, different funds are invested in these tech companies that aren't public or private. So how do you value that? Okay, well, look, so we're talking about debt today. So we, we can talk about that next week. But conceptually, I am going to presume that most people in this room are not active participants in hedge funds or large private equity funds. So. Unless you have a nice inheritance, uh, unless your Bitcoin investment has gone through the roof, which apparently it's been going very well lately, uh, most of us here aren't invested in private equity vehicles that are going to invest in non-publicly traded companies. And what I can tell you is, is to the extent that we participate, that either directly or indirectly we own public equities, we have the same access to the information that large institutions have, in theory, anyway, right? So, all quarterly calls, there's an 800 number or a webcast, and you can dial in. Afterwards, they're posted on the, you know, they're filed with the SEC, and you have access to that information. Uh, the only advantage that a an institution might have is, and I, I can tell you this, having worked in a public publicly traded company, so the larger shareholders do have the opportunity to come and visit, right? Just because if they call. If somebody owns, we had a shareholder in our company that controlled 37% of the stock. That was very odd to have. They actually did not exercise much of a right, but I can tell you that twice a year they would call the chairman and come in and visit. Guess what? You know, we accepted you know, their visit and we could speak with them. It's a very difficult dialogue because you can't share non-public information with that shareholder, but at least there is a, a feeling, a dialogue that you could have. In addition to that, what's important, one of the things that, that people always look for is, maybe you don't look for these things, but how many analysts follow a company? Thinly traded companies have very few analysts following them. You know, you may have large tech firms. Apple might have 50 analysts following that company. Why is that important? Because analysts do have access to investor relations. And again, they don't have access to private information, but there's dialogue going, and they'll come and visit, and they'll get a better understanding of what's happening, and they'll talk to management. And again, a lot of times, feeling um, is going to tell you a lot more than anything else, right? So, uh, yes, Kathleen. Uh, that was actually one of the Wall Street Journal articles for this week about how mutual funds are, you know, there's such a big discrepancy between values because each investor looks at it different. That was a question. Yeah. Yeah. So, on this top, it was real interesting. Yeah, I mean, how I mean, look, twenty dollar difference on the same stock. There, there is a, there is a. I mean, there's a wealth of knowledge in this class that we can apply to, you know, personal investment decisions. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, more than just that, we can apply this to our business decisions as well. You know, so um, from the Economist, this past week's Economist, this is a very interesting one. Because um, you talked about private equity, and private equity is a is a a, a um, very established business in this country. Now, private equity implies what investment in the capital side of businesses, and that's where private equity in this country has historically played. There has been a trend and an evolution, right? So, private equity, just sort of by its name, right, has historically dabbled here. What's happened over time? They've sort of gone up the stack, the capital stack, right? And and where they've really participated is in an area here, in a series of instruments, and we'll talk about some of them later, right? We can generally call this mezzanine. It's not quite up at the top, and it's not at the bottom, right? So they've kind of played in this mezzanine area. Sort of by default, mezzanine is debt. 
Um, but a lot of this debt has convertible features or some sort of equity kickers or warrants or a series of other features or benefits that, you know, make the instrument look like that but also have equity features, okay? And so from that perspective, um, what's, so we need to understand the sources of equity, right? And under such sources of capital. What are the type of returns that private equity firms look for? What kind of returns do private equity firms look for? 20, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, if private equity, by the way, we'll talk later on, we'll talk about something we call core, and I'll, I'll call it core plus or opportunity or value, and I'll try to define that within the context of the real estate space, okay? But these are styles of investing. But we can definitely classify private equity or venture capital funding as opportunistic. And opportunistic funds, by definition, are seeking higher returns. So. Why do I bring all this up? Is just to frame the next article, right? Which is, if you're a private equity firm, are, um, are you going to try to invest in debt or equity instruments? Equity, equity because debt carries what? Risk. Less no, no. Less risk, less returns. I would tell you, typically lower return, because there's no equity upside, right? What do you get when you loan money? You get a coupon, and it's fixed. And that's it. We'll talk about debt ad nauseum later this afternoon. But just naturally, this money is not going to chase that type of instrument. Okay? Now, in addition to that, there may or may not be risk associated with that. We'll talk about what it'll be up to you. There's some people that don't have the stomach for debt, and there's some people that don't have the stomach for equity. Okay? I can tell you that banks, which are highly regulated, don't, commercial banks don't invest in equity because the presumption is that debt is less risky and hence has a lower return expectation. But maybe you don't have the stomach for debt and that's understandable. We're all individuals, okay? So, why do I mention all this stuff? Because curiously, the Economist reports that uh, in Europe, in particular, there is now the creation or evolution of what they are calling private debt funds or private debt firms. So people are going out there, I mean, it says money managers are eager to fill this gap. Seventy billion dollars has been raised for private debt this year. Seventy billion dollars. Now, um, obviously, you know, if corporate, where would corporate bonds like AAA corporate bonds be trading today? What kind of yield would they be offering? Why well, single digits, but that, okay, that could be zero, that could be nine. <laughs> give, me, give me something a little, I'll take nine. I don't want this, I'm not trying to make fun of you, Carol. I, I, no, 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 it's like, so I'll take the nine, but. Two, round two? Two, well, where's the treasury? We'll, we'll go through this later on. Where's the treasury? We just said, well, 10 year treasury is where? 2.3, right? So it better be higher than 2.3, right? Because presumably this is risk free. There has to be something, some sort of premium for it, right? So let's just say they're probably, you know, four to five percent, okay? I don't know, somewhere in that range. Some may be a little bit lower, some may be a little bit higher, right? Now, uh, these private debt funds are looking for sort of higher return. They're targeting nine to twelve percent. Still well below what an opportunity fund is looking for. But what's what is the implication of this? What is what does this tell you? Somebody's willing to assume this risk. Why? 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 Because this is not acceptable, is it, right? If inflation is three percent, right? You get two percent on your money? I mean you're barely keeping up, right? So so, so what this is saying is, and we'll talk about interest rates later on, but there's a whole bunch of societal implications related to the interest rate environment that we have today. Some may be viewed as positive, 
and some are definitely negative. If you're old and you need to live on your return, you can't live on 4%. You need more. So the only way to get more is to do what? Seek, seek an alternative investment that's going to give you a higher yield. And that higher yield is going to imply what? Risk. Higher risk. Now, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, so that sort of talks to, that sort of talks to, and I think it, it's, it's very relevant when we talk about debt today, it talks to the whole sort of shadow lending or shadow banking system that, you know, has been evolving over the last 20, 30 years, 35 years. So historically, what, we, what, what was the business of banks? And obviously to make money, but that is, is to take deposits and, and make, make loans. So commercial banks take deposits and make loans. That's their business. They're regulated and that's their business, okay? So if we needed to borrow money, where would we go? We go to a bank, right? And the bank's regulated. Why? Because what are the bank's liabilities? Our deposits, right? We already went through that last week, right? So, so they're highly regulated. They have to comply with a series of requirements related to collateral and credit analysis and, and, and reserves, right? Do any of these private debt lenders have any of that regulation? You know, the answer is no. Now, that's all great. You heard this here first. This is all going to work until what happens? Until it starts blowing up, a bunch of investors lose their money, and then what are people going to say? How come there's no regulation? Okay, so it's, it this happened too many times. You start getting old, you've seen this movie before, it's just a matter of time. Somebody finds what's, well, you'll hear, you're, you'll hear this, you'll hear this in this class several times. There's this whole cycle that goes like this, right? It goes like this. So, Somebody innovates a new product. It's great. There's obviously flaws with it. Something happens. The government, oh, we need to regulate it. So, there's regulation. Now what happens? A bunch of attorneys and accountants and investment bankers get together and start figuring out ways to create something to circumvent it, right? So, and it's this whole paradigm that's always, always evolving and moving especially as it relates to um, capital markets, okay, and financial instruments. So um, nothing is ever still. It's always in a, in a state of, of, of flux, okay? Now, you know, talking about state of flux, the other kind of interesting thing is I thought credit unions were dead, right? Um, sort of interesting, it, it, the article, this is a separate article, it says credit unions, and it says a little bit of history. I didn't know credit unions started in Germany, 19th century. So in the 1800s in Germany, People started credit unions, okay? So it says like banks, they take deposits and make loans, but they are, what's the one distinction between a commercial bank and a credit union? They're owned by the members. And the implication of the owner membership is that there is a, or there is less of a profit motivation, right? Or profits are distributed to the members in the way of what? Or lower interest rates on loans, right? And higher and higher interest on deposits, okay? And so, curiously, I thought they were dead, right? But uh, in America, in America, 40% of adults belong to credit union, which is up from 36%. So, and, and it says, uh, you know, why, why is it going there? You know, technology's made them provide equal or better customer service, right? And, and people have a higher satisfaction. People aren't happy with, so, the trend has been for these huge banks, right, to amalgamate, right? So I, I read something interesting. It has nothing to do with this, but it does. just go through the textbook. So there's an article, I think yesterday, the day before, in the Wall Street Journal about where is Bank of America based? Bank of America is the largest commercial bank in this country. Where's Bank of America based? I'm asking you that question. At least they're not in America. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, it's not, it's not a trick question. Come on, everybody should know that. 
Charlotte. I mean, it's, everybody knows that. Charlotte. Charlotte, North Carolina. But the question is, is it really? Eight, eight out of their 11 top executives and every one of their officers lives outside of Charlotte. They're all over the place. So should that be a concern? Uh, bank's not going anywhere, right? So it's the largest financial institution. I remember going to pitch some work when it was still Nations Bank before they actually bought the Bank of America out of San Francisco as Nations Bank. I remember this was when I was back in my graphic arts and it was a really dynamic organization and they drove, they were Charlotte and Charlotte was Nations Bank, you know, well, they had Wachovia as well, First Union, right, before, so it was a two bank, you know, but, but, but Nations Bank sort of, and it was like a really funky, um, progressive um, environment, you know, they, huge tower and everybody worked there and everybody was on one page. What do you think happens to an institution where the executives don't even work or the, you know, most of the top managers work? You know, one of the things of, you guys heard of socks? Yep. And it's not the Sorry. white socks or the red socks. <laughs> the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, right? So this was a response to what? So the Enron collectively, but the whole sort of telecom uh, and, 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 and infrastructure plays in the late 1990s, early 2000s, right? The NASDAQ tech bubble and all that. So, so Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, imposed a series of regulations on companies. It, it, you know, they strengthened. So it was Enron, but it was, it was Arthur Anderson, you know, and audits and all that. And, so they imposed a series of stiffer, you know, <coughs> guidelines on auditors, and, and and one of them is to really companies have to go through the whole process of internal audits and identification and controls. That always existed, but it's a little bit more stringent now. And one of the most important basic tenets of the whole control structure in a company, through Sarbanes Oxley, is that the tone is set at the top. The tone of a company is set at the top. The way a CEO behaves, the way a CEO and his organization behaves is the way the company behaves. You own several restaurants. If you were not present, what would happen? They would change it. But ultimately, <laughs> your businesses take, take, take your image and, and project it into the marketplace, right? I, uh, you know, stupid little story, but just to set it, one of the one of the companies that blew up in this time frame was a company called WorldCom. I don't know if you guys remember WorldCom, telecommunications company. And they blew up why? Accounting fraud, right? They used to take all their repairs and maintenance expenses and capitalize them every quarter. So, you know, they were just getting like bigger and more profitable, but they were actually just bleeding money. Well my story is when I was in graphic arts, we sort of got away from printing and we were doing a lot of telemarketing. We had call centers, so we bought a lot of telco services. And I used to use AT&T, it was a professional regulated business or just coming out of regulation. Well, WorldCom was always knocking on our door. And it was well known in South Florida that WorldCom had a plan for everybody. You wanted a credit card to do business with them, they would get you that. You wanted to go snort cocaine, they would get you that. It just was a, no, it was just a really bad, it was a really bad corporate culture. Well, guess what? It all, it all, you know, it all started, okay, with, with Bernie Ambers at the top. The guy was a crook. The people who worked for him were crooks. What happened? It all flowed down, right? So, why do I say all this stuff? So you got B of A, you've got a company that none of their executives are together. They're all over the place. Would, would any, I don't know, do any of you bank at B of A? Yeah. Okay, but it's the nation's largest bank and there's only two out of 26 people that are using them, right? So I just bring that up, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe it's just not a place that gives you great service and that's why credit unions can all of a sudden come in and make things easier, right? You know, I, I belong to the old Eastern Airlines Credit Union. It's called, uh, they went up, belly up, and it's Space Coast now. I, mean, I get emails from them all the time. They want to, they'll buy the car for you and like give you a loan and almost pay you for it, you know? It's, no, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's amazing. So 
Um, so anyway. in terms of commercial banks, um, for, who do you go for these days? Right. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I, don't guys, no, I love JP Morgan Chase. 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 Yeah, so, so, I, look, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, so I'm, I don't know anything. I don't work. I mean, I can't get a job. I, <laughs> <laughs> so, I can choose what you're looking for. If you're looking for a consumer looking for a great loan against your region's bank, as a business, yeah. as a real estate person, you might want to go with Wells Fargo, depending well, on what the Well, so, so I was going to tell you the last of my experiences, my personal experiences in the real estate space was I less and less went to large banks. We finance all of our construction with, with community banks. So, and if the loan was too big, so, you know, most community banks in South Florida don't like to get in more than $20, $30 million into a deal. But they'll underwrite, most have lending capacity, or they can, maximum loan is about 15% of their capital. The large community banks down here do the math, they're what, $4 billion, roughly 10% capital, so $400 million capital. 15% of that is what? 60, 70 million dollars. Most of these banks can, you know, underwrite a loan up to that. But they don't want to they don't want to hold the paper. So what they'll do is this, you know, Mercantile will go to Ocean Bank, will go to City National or Total Bank, and at least take, you know, 15 million bucks out of a loan or something like that. So in our case, we went to a small guy's why? Because we could talk to people, right? Uh, and then the other one is is Real large deals, we went to institutional partners and let them put the debt piece through whatever relationships they had on a national level. So we go do a deal with Pru and let them bring the Pru mortgage guys in and do the deal. We do a deal with, 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 with A and B, which is not Prologis. They bring their guy from Wells Fargo that was in their back door in San Francisco and do the deal. Because a local guy, every time I went, so the last time I went to B of A, um, I was looking for like, let's say 36, 37 million bucks, and it was a landfill, okay? There was a lot of risk with it outside the urban development boundary, so I went to B of A. They, they always came, you know, the, the, the South, head of South Florida Banking would come, he'd bring all his little lieutenants, they wanted to go to lunch with you, so, okay, Vinny. Oh, well... Uh, you know, we're really not, you know, in the market right now. You know, we've been told to, you know, pay our real estate exposure. Take all the guy at Wachovia, okay? I'll never forget this. Go get this one. He's like, oh, well, why don't you bring us a deal that's more within our underwriting, you know, parameters? I, I, I wasn't very nice with him. Because, <laughs> no. <laughs> because what happens is, is th that's your opportunity when you're in business, right? When somebody gives you a chance, you got to take it. And they didn't want to take it. So I want to answer your question. I want the small banks. Yes, too long. So the, actually, the climate changes constantly. And when it comes to City National, two weeks ago, they finalized the transition. They deal with the, the Cachillia Bank, right. So does that mean that now the out of the country banks that are coming over, um, the Spirit of Santo, City National, now they have more lending power, unlimited capital? They're willing to take risky risks that other banks like Bank of America or Wells Fargo are not willing to take. For example, Wells Fargo says to me, no, we don't finance real estate on restaurants. That's it, period. But uh, City National now is the one that I'm with, and I think they have some great programs. So yep. how does the infuse of foreign capital come in when they take over a bank and change the climate? So. Um I mean, it, it can change or not, and there's different scenarios. I'm not a banking guy, okay? And every situation is different. Um, the Chilean bank that bought City Nationals had a, uh, an agency here in Miami for a lot of years. And Chile has the problem that they, they privatized, some years ago, they privatized um, their pension fund. It's per capita the wealthiest country in Latin America. And it's a relatively small country. And so they... They have funds that they can't reinvest in their country. So a large publicly traded bank, it's the largest bank in Chile, the only way they can grow is by going overseas. So in, in their corporate culture, 
the only way they can grow is go somewhere else. Um, I have a good friend who works for you know, this agency, and I haven't had lunch with him in a few weeks, but he's been very involved in the whole process. The intentions of that bank is to continue to leave local professional management running the bank as if it were a community bank, and they're not even going to integrate it with, with their agency. They're going to maintain their agency separate for their international work, and don't have a local bank. So it's like a foreign investor making an investment. Um, things like Total Bank, Caja Madrid that had bought City National from Leonard Abbas. Um, Total Bank was bought by Banco Popular, Sabadell, which has bought Bank United and a whole bunch of others. The Spanish bank's perspective is, is slightly different, but the same thing. Iberian Peninsula, other than Santander and BB, BBVA, the smaller banks have not been able to grow outside of you know, Europe or outside the, the peninsula in Europe because they just don't have the capital. But opportunities like community banks have, have worked for that. And so they're also looking to grow outside their home markets. The strategy that they've used that I'm aware of so far is maintain local management and allow them to continue to function as a, as a community bank. Mercantil has been owned by a Venezuelan group for years and they operate totally independent of the interests of Venezuela and their business is here. They're owned you know, by foreigners, but they're still doing banking business here. I think it's more an issue of it's a smaller community bank than anything else, and community banks by default have to pick up what the larger pieces can't do. So if you're regions, you can say, oh, I'm too exposed to restaurant real estate or Wells Fargo, I'm too, or that, that's, that doesn't fit our model. I had a friend that worked for, forget the name, but a, a publicly traded North Carolina based bank. So they, they bought a bunch of bankrupt little banks down here, one was called Sun America or Sun something or other, whatever. But so they hired this guy, he's a real estate lender, and they said to him, all we want is medically owned, uh, owner occupied space. That's all they wanted to loan. And eventually he left the bank. But they, they knew what their target was in South Florida. They wanted doctors and they wanted doctors who owned their medical practice and their, their buildings. And that's all they would finance. But a community bank has to look you know, it's going back to when I called Mr. White at Wachovia and said, here's your chance, he didn't jump on it. But the community banks, you know, when you're in the outfield, you got to chase fly balls. And the community banks are in the outfield. So anyway, I mean, it's kind of long-winded, but it's important because in real estate, who do we go to? Who do we go to? We have to go to banks, construction loans, banks, short-term money, variable interest rate, right? And the community banks are the ones that are more likely going to take the risk with a smaller guy in a community. Yes? What, what's your take on Ally, the Ally Bank? Uh, I hear that they're on the scooping right now. Well, Ally is, is, an, is, a, is, the, is the remnants of GMAC. General, GMAC? GMAC, okay. General Motors Acceptance Corporation, which was a... Car lending entity. It was a... In the context of the capital markets class, what did we go over last week? It was a finance company. And what is a finance company? They were companies that were allied or historically allied to large industrial groups that would use what? The balance sheet of the parent company to issue what? To finance themselves. Commercial paper, short term debt, right? So GMAC, just like GE Capital, right? Uh, just like Ford Motor Credit or industrial or finance companies that historically financed cars, but GMAC did what else? D GMAC became a huge player in the commercial real estate space. Um, they had a company called, or a subsidiary called ResCap. And ResCap was a big lender in mezzanine and other debt for multifamily, residential. So. It, it grew from what its base was to a you know, multi-pronged business. They got into derivatives, and part of GM's downfall was GMAC. So um, GMAC, GMAC sort of went a different route. I think Cerberus bought a, a piece of that first, and then 
Cerberus wound up the fault. Again, long story short, the, the government wound up with it, and they sort of created this ally bank as a result of it. It's never had a good asset base, and it's been sort of a transformational entity. I don't know how many branches they have. I, I, it's, 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 again, a business that has financed itself with a significant amount of debt, and has had dubious credit quality, right? I looked at a preferred stock they had, it was it was like triple C rated. For a bank or financial institution to have a triple C rated preferred stock is not a good sign. Noah. They got themselves in uh, some trouble, I think it was like a year or two ago, because someone reverse engineered the formula they were using for lending, and what they were doing was they were taking your family name, uh, putting it with the zip code, and this guy that reverse engineered it was able to see that they were basing it off of race, and you get different, um, you get different. So there's profiling practices. involved. There's profiling based on your name, going through the family tree, based on the zip code, and then just hop around. Yeah, I, I would, I would tell you this. I, um, and again, I'm not a banking expert, but banks are highly regulated, and regula you know, regulators are, are continually visiting and evaluating. Rebecca, please put it away or go outside. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I'm just trying to reformulate the thought. So they're continually evaluating the credit quality of their portfolio. And, and what happens is banks have an obligation to classify their loans. Does anybody know what that means? I get all this like, sorry? Yeah, so you, so you got to stratify your loan portfolio into different, and basically you kind of get into what are performing loans versus what are called non-performing loans, right? Yeah, I haven't done a bank audit in, you know, 30 something years, so I don't remember exactly. Good. But, but the classifications are more, ultimately it has to do with being current on payments. And so for example, um, why do construction loans typically have interest reserves? Why do construction loans have interest reserves? There's two reasons for that. There's one. Well, no, no, because you you can have a, you can have a contingency, or or a bank may allow a contingency on a loan, but an interest reserve in particular is for the benefit of the developer because during a development period yeah, you're not generating money. cash flow. Right. So, and so how do you service debt? If you gotta go borrow money to build, how are you gonna have money to pay debt? So for the benefit of the lender or the borrower, it's so that there is the cash flow. But the other side of it is 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 so that the bank <laughs> is being paid. They are making a loan to you so that you can pay them interest. And when you pay them interest, even though you loan them the money, you're not a performing loan, okay? And so what happens is, depending on the level of uh, uh, performance, you reserve. So you know, if um, you know, you, you know, it's the typical sort of buckets, right? Um, so you know, if you're less than 30 days, you don't, you know, you don't have to reserve anything. If you're 30 to 60, you have to reserve X amount. But it gets to a point where I think. When loans are like 90% or 90 days overdue, not percent, 90 days overdue, uh, you have to fully reserve for them. And so what happens is, is when you reserve for a loan, what happens to your capital base? So what's the journal entry? Those of you taking an accounting class, let's do the journal entry. What's the journal entry for a, a loan loss reserve? What do we debit? Losses, right? P&L, we debit the P&L, right? And what do we credit? an allowance account on the balance sheet, right? And so, um, but this is a loss. That loss reduces your net income. A lower net income does what? It lowers your capital base. If you have a lower capital base, if our lending limit is based on our capital base, what does a lower capital base mean? It means, it means, it means we loan less, right? So what are banks trying to keep all their loans in a performing level, performing area, okay? And one of the ways to look at the, the quality of a bank's, the bank's financial statements is to take a look at the ratio of 
per performing versus non-performing loans. Okay, so yes, Maricela. Aren't there interest reserves um, uh, specified when you sign the loan? Like uh, you don't have to wait to be do a certain period of time. It's uh, supposed to pay bank whatever, whether you're performing or not performing. So the, you you negotiate at the time of negotiating a construction loan, you will negotiate an interest reserve. But you start paying day one. You don't. Well, so is interest paid in advance or in arrears? In advance. Is but interest yeah. paid oh, in no, advance no, 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 or in arrears? Arrears. Yeah. But okay. You, you take in the accounting class. Leases are paid how? In this country, yeah. typically yeah. leases are paid in advance. in advance. Interest typically in this country is paid in arrears. in arrears. So would we pay interest day one? No, we go through a month. Let's go. Let's go through a cycle. We start building for a month. The G sends, GC sends us an invoice, right? And we promise to pay the GC. So this is he works for 30 days. He bills us somewhere around here. We're going to pay him, right? So here's when we're going to so like around day 50 is when we're actually going to draw the money from the loan, right? And then that that's going to be outstanding 30 days, okay? So somewhere, you know, 80, 90 days after construction starts, we're going to have our first interest payment due. Yeah, but how do, you, uh, 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 how do you make a relation between the time frame and the performing and the classifying? Because you're paying it anyway. I mean, No, 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 no. There's, so what I just said is the reason that, that, that uh, banks are willing to provide a, an interest reserve is one, for the benefit of the borrower, because the borrower doesn't have the cash flow to do it. And second of all, so that they also can keep their loans classified as performing. So they're going to send you a bill 30 days after you borrowed money, and then you're going to draw from it that day, and that loan's going to be performing. They're going to pay themselves that day, and your loan is always going to be performing. Till you finish the project, you didn't sell it, you didn't lease it, you can't make payments, you can't refinance it, and it turns up, now they got a problem. Yes, to what? Construction interest reserve specifically. Yes. They be regarded as startup cost and therefore they are an asset and amortized over time. Can okay. So so yeah, there, there was a accounting, but so okay. right. So that's a big you can read for me. that's we'll talk about that in the accounting class. There was a I started reading an article in the Journal of Accountancy this week and it was way beyond my level of interest, okay? But number one <laughs> There, there's different treatment, obviously, for tax and book as it relates to startup costs. To answer your, your specific question, the answer is interest is not a startup cost, but interest during a development period is capitalized under FASB 34. And we'll go into that in the accounting class, okay? So the answer is yes. Really. The answer is it's capitalized and then recognized. So then FASB 66 deals with revenue recognition and 67 deals with how do you allocate construction period cost to things that you sell, right? Because ultimately it's about matching revenues with expenses. Therefore, it would not decrease the income if we consider it as part of the startup cost. Well, it, right? during, so, so, right, that's, again, this is a, sort of an accounting class. So during a development period, you, you really have very few P&L or income items. You're really just bulking up the balance sheet yes. until you finish the development period, and then you start recognizing revenue and expenses. But we'll go over all that in the accounting class. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, can I add something to what you Yes, said? Carol. The cost of interest in your construction period is a part of the cost of acquiring the, 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 the capital asset. So therefore, not if a deduction on the expense. If you had to pay for trash removal and all that, Certain things you can, yep. you can expense, but if you're talking about as a part of the cost, the true cost, because if you bought the thing already done up, you pay more for it. Well, but if you're constructing, yeah, but but we'll Car Carol, we'll get we'll get into because I I will let you know that you can in fact trash removal during a development period as long the as it's dumpster, related the big as long as it's related to the development can definitely and should definitely be capitalized. So the point is because you want the language to look at you favorably, whatever you can classify as an asset to be amortized over time and depreciated over time is, well, is valuable. Well maybe 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 not, but let's that's a that's a credit analysis question. Let's 
Let's move on. Listen, a couple of things. Uh, you asked the question, Noah, and there are a couple of articles. Here's one of them. I forget what the other one was. But one of them is, so, so what, what, what's, happened, what's happened is, is that uh, the Fed, not the BIS, the Fed has um, set down certain rules regarding the capital structure that banks are required to maintain, and specifically what they've gone down. And I, I don't know how this all has evolved or not, but they basically um, are going to require banks to maintain a certain level of their debt or their convertible debt or their preferred stock stack as equity in the event that certain situations happen. Okay. Now, again, I'm not a I'm not an expert on how banks finance themselves, but banks need a lot of money, right? So they've got a certain traditional common stock equity base, but there's a whole series of things that look like equity at banks that may look like equity, but may be debt. The first one is they've got all kinds of preferred stock issuances, okay? And you know, we, we read last week that preferred stock, we'll talk a little bit more about it today, preferred stock has debt features and equity features, so it looks like equity for certain things, but for others it's like debt. So all of a sudden all this stuff has to be, you know, has to stay as, as like, you know, equity. So equity is the residual interest, right? So that means you've got to pay secured creditors first, okay? But in addition to that, they also issue a whole bunch of things that are called like um, trust certificates. Okay, some of it are, are, is directly tied to certain income streams or inc income flows. So that stuff has to stay now as equity as well. And then um, over and above that, there's all kinds of un unsecured debt that they have, you know, um, so the ventures that they issue, et cetera. So, it, so the Fed's kind of saying, hey, listen, your, your equity is all this stuff in the event of a cat catastrophic event. And as a result of that, Standard & Poor's has said that they are likely going to have to cut the, the credit rating on the eight major banks in this country, the ones that you know are you know systemic, you know, uh, or could cause systemic risk. And so, what's what's the, we'll talk about credit ratings later. But what's the implication of a lower credit rating? Inability to get capital. Well, so maybe not inability, but like higher it's going to cost you more, right? Uh, so you know, uh, yes, Alexander, the higher cost, right? Yes, Your uh, character goes down as well. You know, Sorry? Your character goes down as a bank. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, maybe, I don't know. I mean, I, I think most consumers aren't going to look at S&P or Moody ratings as a, you know, sense of fidelity. But, 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 you know, but maybe. Look, I, I, I was going down a path before what I was going to say because of the regulation. Banks don't get closed down overnight, okay? So, you know, with all the regulation that's in place, banks will uh, will be issued uh, uh, cease and desist letters, which will force them to stop certain activity and make certain corrections. And if within certain periods those aren't made, you know, it's not surprising that on a Friday at four o'clock regulators walk in, and on Monday. Uh, there's a new name on the sign, you know, and the bank's been taken over and it's been sold to another institution. And so, you know, up to now, thank God, uh, depositors in this country have not lost money. The, the fund, the FDIC has been able to, um, you know, provide, or there's been sufficient interest to place sufficient assets out there that uh, we haven't had that. Maybe we can talk about this in another class a little bit more, but the ECB, what the ECB is the... ECB is the European Central Bank, so it's it's kind of like a Federal Reserve for Europe, but it's not, okay? But it's it's doing their own version of quantitative easing. And I, I was shocked uh, at the magnitude. I, I knew that they increased it, but they're, they have been buying and continue to anticipate buying a minimum of 60 billion euros a month of debt until September 2016 for another year. So that's another $720 billion. So when the central bank buys debt, a lot of things happen. Sort of short term, you're giving the economy some sugar, right? You're providing liquidity. You know, the question, the question that we'll see the answer to in this country, and 
in Europe is, is what happens if interest rates go up and central banks are holding a bunch of debt and the value of that debt now goes down. So ultimately, it's providing liquidity, it's financing deficits, blah, 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 blah. We won't spend a lot of money, I mean, a lot of time on this, but so what's going on in Brazil? And why is that important here? What's going on in Brazil? It's not carnival time yet. <laughs> what's going on in Brazil? Is the economy going well? No. no. Turmoil. No. Okay, so there's been all kinds of political turmoil. And I got, Brazil's a country of uh, future, you know, it's a country of the future always. Um, so there's government turmoil, there's the, the ruling party's been, you know, caught up in another sort of graft scandal, people are calling for impeachment, um, there's all kinds of concerns economically. Um, that's caused their currency to drop to what? What's four the ice? Four, four to one. Four to one. Yeah, no, and beyond, right? So they were almost, they were like at one and change, and so that means that in dollar terms, Somebody could be like they could be at 25% of the work worth that they were two years ago. So, who are the largest, or who are one of the largest groups of investors in residential condominium developments in South Florida over the last five, six, seven years? Brazilians. What's happening now? It's not only that they're not buying; it's they're liquidating holdings in order to raise capital and bring it back home to deal with the debt they have at home. You know, part of the problem that a lot of these economies have is that even though they are local currency based, a lot of the debt that they have is dollar denominated because that's how the banks protect themselves too. And so people get affected by currency you know, effects. So people are having to sell condos here to raise capital. At least that's what the Herald was reporting this week. So if you start seeing pressure, then you might see some of the you know, rapid rise that we've had in condos here, kind of coming back up, kind of, you know, pushing back down. I don't think it's for a crisis. Um, Chinese manager of high-flying funds is arrested in an insider trading case. I don't know if any of you saw this, but, so it's a guy named Chu Chang, nicknamed Big Chu. <laughs> so the Big Chu was apprehended, okay? Big Chu. So, but, but so what's insider trading? What's insider trading? What is insider trading? There's somebody with non public in a word of fraud. Hold on, right, right, Ryan is, Ryan is. I'm, I'm attempting. Yeah, 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 no, no. It's, it's, you're, you're right somebody now. with, with non public, you know, uh, private knowledge of a uh, company's business makes a trade based on that knowledge. And, and, that, is, and that is illegal in this country. Okay, so in most developed countries, in most developed economies, it is illegal to make equity or any other public security trades with non-public information. Um, I can tell you as an officer in a publicly traded company, for all practical purposes, I was precluded from transacting in our company stock. There, there were very few windows, so I, you know we had to wait till we, we published you know, quarterly data, and then we had a very short window after that in which we could make trades, okay? And then that, the percentage of what we held had to be a small percent. So, again, for all practical purposes, we could trade. Why? Because there was always a presumption because we were an insider that we knew something that other people didn't know, okay? So in this country, it's, I, you know, I've told this case, the story, I might go into it in detail another, a year and a half ago, I was in Chicago testifying in an insider trading case when we sold a company. And so it happens. But it happens a lot more outside this country. And the reason I bring it up is because when, you know, we're always told we should, you know, invest a portion of our portfolio internationally. And, and that's probably right. But we need to be very careful where we invest and where there's transparency, right? So in, in, in China this year, the stock market, the major index went down 40%. That's gone back up 20% in a month, you know, that, I don't have a stomach for that. And most people probably shouldn't, but that also implies that there's probably movements there that are happening that are being manipulated somehow. And speaking of that, the Department of Justice in this country and the uh, CFTC, which is a Currency Futures Trading Commission, uh, are investigating banks 
um, in relation to government debt auctions. And so there really isn't a, a public market for debt. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. And debt, treasuries are primarily institutionally traded. We can open up an account with the U.S. Treasury and buy T-bills. But for the most part, all that is traded institutionally. And, and so uh, controlled by a, a small number of broker dealers. And now they're, they're alleging that there is some sort of collusion and price rigging and price fixing, similar to what happened with LIBOR. We'll talk about LIBOR later on, okay? But I can tell you, my, my, my personal take on this one is kind of interesting. I, I've used preferred stocks the last five or six years as, I'll get to them, I've used preferred stocks as a proxy for bonds. I need current income. You know, I can't get a job, I gotta pay bills, I buy preferred stocks, they give me a better return. I, I like the risk return profile, but they're they've got their own quirks and nuances, all right? There's call issues involved with that, um, and then there's also um, um, you know there's there's just risk associated, there's definitely interest rate sensitivity attached to it. So anyway, so one of the bonds I was one of the preferred stocks I was holding was called a few months ago. I think it was a MetLife preferred stock that I had. They called and reissued. Well, why did they reissue? Because they could reissue at a lower rate. I don't like that, right? <laughs> but I said, wait, look, I like, I like the, I like, was, the coupon was like six and a half percent or whatever. So I said, so I'm, I'm getting bumped from like a seven and a half to <laughs> six and a half, but I want to buy it. But I want to buy it as an original issuance. I want to buy it in the primary markets. So I start digging around, where can I buy a preferred stock IPO? Can't get anywhere. So I call the bond desk at Schwab, because again, you can't just deal with your regular guy, you gotta call the bond desk at all these trade. And you know, then I called somebody in Denver that was like their specialist in this stuff. And the bottom line was, you can't. You cannot buy a preferred stock IPO. It's sold institutionally, there's, we'll talk about it later. Preferred stocks tend to be owned by companies as an investment vehicle. But what I've noticed is, is they all they, they all are issued at a discount, a small discount. But as soon as they hit the secondary market, there's a huge premium. So you know it's a closed market. It's a closed market. It's played by very few people, and there's arbitrage gains in it automatically. You know. They buy, automatically buy at a discount, and they automatically sell at a premium. And as an investor, you're stuck in the middle, you know, you lose money. Yes, no? Um, I think they actually just sent people to jail over the LIBOR uh, thing. Right, so, I mean, there's been LIBOR action. I, I think this week, I don't know if it was jail, or it was actually there's some prosecution now going on in this country, okay? Because that, that was happening in, in the UK. Now, um, <clears throat> On 11-4, not yesterday, before the jobs report, the Federal Reserve Chair and two of the other governors had already given speeches this week saying that, um, you know, they were ready to raise interest rates. So you got to read the tea leaves continually because I'm telling you, you can make or lose a lot of money if you can anticipate these changes, right? So I'm talking to you as a trader, right? So if you're holding... If you're holding a U.S. Treasury, if you're holding a 10-year note, and it's yielding 2%, and the yield goes up to 2.3%, what does that mean to Valley? What does that mean to Valley? What happens to the Valley? It goes down. The value goes down. So if you're holding it, what are you going to do? You're going to lose money. So you can either sell, or you can hold the material. Well, you can go to, or you can go short. Right? If you know interest rates are going to go up, you can be short and let somebody else take the risk, right? So in real estate, we know interest rates are going to go up. What are we going to do? Let's fix the rate now, right? Let's fix it. Let's not assume risk, right? So anyway, somebody asked the other day, Noah, is crowdfunding truly ready for the masses? And this is an article from uh, a magazine called... Uh, National Real Estate Investor. So, I, w I was talking to, when you asked a question the other day, I wasn't talking 
to the most recent liberalization of, uh, of, of, uh, of private equity or crowdfunding, which is this Title III of the Jobs Act. Okay, the SEC finally approved that on the 30th. You know, firm, firms will be able to uh, um, raise up to a million dollars from non-accredited investors. Okay, starting in early 2016. Now, what this particular article says, their view is, is that, you know, they always find people talk on both sides because everybody's selling something. This could be a transformative way to raise capital going forward, okay? Now, risks. Uh, real estate crowdfunding is opening up at a time to non-accredited investors at a time when many real estate assets are, are reaching historical high levels. And there's some concern about whether people are really communicating the risks and the rewards of that to the investors, right? And so what will happen? I, I personally keep going back to I think the biggest issue with crowdfunding for real estate is going to be the liquidity or lack of liquidity and whether investors are really going to be aware of the fact that they get into something and they can't get out. In real estate, we saw something like this that were called ticks many years ago. Tenancy in common, people were getting together, or promoters were getting people together, buying real estate assets as tenants in common. And you get into the problem of this guy wants to sell, the other 29 guys don't want to sell. I need to sell. How do I get liquidity? That still hasn't been addressed. So, Pete, yeah. any? Uh, just one question. What is the threshold that I'm doing? So, Title III, and I'm not this is new to me as well, Title III of the Jobs Act, you can raise up to $1 million from non accredited individuals. Now, I don't know what the total capital raise can be under this title. That's not in this article. So, I mean, we can look at it for next week. See if I remember. So, the SEC is the one, they are going to regulate that, or FINRA? It, it says it says in this article, SEC. I'll do I'll do a little bit more um, 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 research on it. The problem is, listen, it's all a panacea. At the end, of, you know, you know, oh wow, I can raise money. You still got to sell your idea. Oh, there's the internet. You still got to convince somebody to give you money, and you got to make them comfortable, okay, with where that money's going. Somebody talked the other day about the EB5 program, and and uh, this guy Larry Silverstein, who's um, the guy that's doing um, the World Trade Center rebuild is looking to raise $500 million. $500 million from Chinese investors, each at a clip of uh, 500000 bucks. So what's that, like 10000 of them or whatever? So... Is that ended on December, though? Yeah, so he's got a short window to do it. Now, I don't know. It ends in... There's a short fuse on it, but, you know... My thing's going to be some, somebody will likely look for an extension and try to extend it. I don't know. But what I heard is that they're not changing. When they change it is the amount that it will cost you from 500, uh, it's going to go up to 800 a million dollars. That would be the change. This was the 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 deadline was not in this article. That, I read that, no, no, here it is. With a key portion of EB-5 due to expire December 11th. And I don't know what that key section is, so maybe it's that they're raising the requirement, the, yeah. the minimum threshold. And, um, I just wanted to make a comment on the Chinese uh, crowdfunding. Yes. I think it's extremely dangerous crowdfunding, in my opinion, to sell it to non-sophisticated investors. I saw one, uh, group that it was raising money through crowdfunding for a hotel, and one of the non-credited investors called me and I said, "Can you look at this?" And I look at it, and they were not taking into account any research for replacement to an entire cash flow. So basically, at some point, they were start calling money for research, and all the interest or gains were going to be lost. But just little details of their models that were just not, a non credited investor will never look at it, will never understand it. Um, and that is a disaster. You know, if you, if you look at, if you look at, <coughs> if you look cap, at capital raising from a professional perspective, you know, 
the question ultimately comes up, you know, how many scammers are out there? And there's a reason why there's such tight regulation on, 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 on debt and equity raising. Because historically, you know, I said this the other day, I don't know if we're good or bad as people, but there's definitely people who do bad things out there. And it does definitely um, lend itself to preying on people that are not informed enough to even ask the right question. And in your case, at least they had a friend that could look at something. In a lot of cases, where people are going to look, oh, it's 9 to 12 percent. Look, I deal with this with my mother all the time. You know, my parents, my dad's 85, my mom is 78. So my mom always wants to know that this isn't giving me enough return. Oh, yeah, but you can't afford to lose what you have. <clears throat> yeah, but I need to make money because we, and so, you know, like they went, they went to um, one of these banks, whatever, Wachovia or whatever, one of these banks, whatever, Sun, it was SunTrust. They went to SunTrust. And they had like a CD that was expiring or something. And I just said, just renew it. So I, I, go, I, I go to my parents' house every Sunday. And so my mom says, look, here, we bought this, uh, whatever, it's like a closed end fund. So they give me a paper. You know, I, I had my glasses. So I start reading it. And she's like, oh, it's like, it's, it's great. There are no commissions. That is it, some trust. There are no commissions. Um, it invests in like, uh, <clears throat> like green initiative. It wasn't green, but it was like, it doesn't invest in like China and you know whatever, and uh, and it's it's guaranteed to give me six or seven percent. So I already knew that they got yeah they got ripped off, you know. So, so these things <laughs> at these banks, when you go to a financial uh, advisor at a bank, they're going to sell you stuff that have loads up front, uh, and there's no guaranteed return, and they're going to invest in whatever. It's totally discretionary. So sure enough, I read it. There was no guaranteed, you know, return. There was no, there was no guarantee, obviously, on the funds. Uh, it specifically said it could invest anywhere in the world, and it had like a six percent load on it. So I, I, I said, I said, listen, I'm taking your keys away. You know, I go, you guys, I go, you guys, you either, you either go to my brother or you come to me before you buy any of these things. So, you know, my mom started crying. <laughs> You can't, you know, it's like, it's like we took their keys away, you know. But, 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 but the problem is you, you prey on people that don't know. And so, and I said, I bet you this guy said to you, because I know, look, I know a guy used to do this, so I know the way they scam. They go, oh, because you go, well, is this guaranteed? Well, this is SunTrust. We, uh, how can we sell you something that's not good, that's not good for you? You know, like, they sort of play with words that make you believe, or they'll just flat out lie, you know. So, anyway. So I can just imagine, you know, you're going to prey on people with money, and uh, I, I, uh, I, I wish we could have, the, the last thing I want to talk about, it's not a current event, but we talked the other day about, uh, I think I, I mentioned in passing something called the uh, psychology of investing, and so, you know, there's a whole bunch of basic underlying principles when we talk about risk and return and all that, and some of them are things like, we're in a perfect capital market in which all information is widely and freely distributed, right? But one of the other one of the other basic assumptions in in the realm of real estate is that we are all rational investors, right? And when we define when we define rational investors, one of the things that we look for is that we uh, are risk averse, right? And I said the other day, you know, are we really risk averse or are we loss averse? I wanted to do the little sort of scenario. That I wanted. So, faced with a scenario in which, with a flip of a coin, Chad, with a flip of a coin, you could make a thousand dollars or lose a thousand dollars. Would you take that proposition? I do it all the time in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. But we're in the realm of investing. Okay. And that's that's not gambling. <laughs> That's a different thing. So, would you take it or not? Because from an expected, from an expected return perspective, right? From an ex expected return perspective, right? You should be indifferent, right? Because your expected return is zero, right? You do this enough, the expected return is zero, right? Who in this class? Let's just do this. Who in this class would take this? Nobody would take it. We have no risk takers in this class. I'll do it like twice to see. 
<laughs> so, I mean, I've done this before, and some classes I actually get 